My name is Robert Panar, professor of English and drama here in NTRD, National Technical Institute for the Deaf in Rochester Institute of Technology, at Rochester, New York. The deaf American has mm, come a long way since the year 1817, when the first school for the deaf was established in Hartford, Connecticut. They have really overcome their handicap of deafness and earned their mm, rightful place in the sun. And in doing that, they have succeeded in contributing to the cultural growth of um, America. This program focuses on life stories of several deaf Americans. First deaf person to become famous in America was a Frenchman named Laurent Clark. Clark was born in France in 1785. Because of an accidental fall while he was still a baby, he became deaf. He went to the school for the deaf in uh, Paris called the Royal Institution for Deaf Mute. And he progressed swiftly. He became an outstanding teacher. When the American clergyman named uh, Thomas Gallaudet was traveling in Europe trying to find the best and most successful method of teaching the deaf, he met a person from that school who invited him to study in that school in France. He met Laurent Clark, and Clark, whose son was <coughs> taught Gallaudet the sign language. Gallaudet could only stay six months, and he had to go back to America. So he asked uh, Clark if he would help him establish that school in America. Clark had to think about that. It meant going to a different world, strange world, where he heard stories about Indians and hostile people. But finally, he accepted that plan, and he accompanied Gallaudet to America. Their trip required 52 days to go across the Atlantic. During that time, Clark taught Gallaudet sign language, and Gallaudet taught Clark the English language. When they arrived in Hartford, they had many, many speeches to make to impress the people in trying to earn funds for the establishment of that school. Finally, they succeeded to establish school in April 1817. Clark became outstanding teacher, and more than that, he trained uh, many, many teachers from different places, different schools in America. For example, in 1819, he went to Philadelphia for one year to help establish that school for the deaf called today Mount Airy School. He was honored mm, in many ways. Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, gave him an honorary degree. When he died, he was called uh, the Apostle for the Deaf in the New World. And he became the perfect role 
model for fruitful deaf teachers in America. Smith was born in Dodsworth County, New York. When he was a small boy, he became ill, and that led to a hearing loss, also affected his lungs. The family moved south to Mississippi, where they bought a farm, and Smith grew up on the farm, became healthy again. He went hunting and surfing. He had a dog, and he trained that dog to listen to strange sounds and noises to warn Death Smith of danger. What would the dog do? You know, pull the rag, and Smith oh, was ready for any danger. That was his hearing ear dog. When the war for Texas independence began in 1835, Smith joined the Texas Army. He became a leading scout <coughs> because he knew all the territory and he had four boys and was very brave. In the Battle of Conception in 1835, Smith led the soldiers through a heavy fog, surprised the Mexican Army and defeated them. Smith got the eyes of General Sam Houston, commander in chief of the Texas Army. He made Smith his number one mm, uh, scout. Houston called Duff Smith mm, the eyes of the Texas Army. Mm. In the Battle of San Jacinto in 1836, Smith surprised the Mexican soldiers again. He led the Texas troop to cut down the bridge so that the Mexicans couldn't retreat. When the bridge collapsed, Duff Smith joined the fighting and he started the bridge was down. The Mexicans can't retreat and remember the Alamo. And they defeated the Mexicans. The next day, chief of the Mexicans, Santa Ana, surrendered. And Sam Houston accepted the surrender. Right next to General Sam Houston was Duff Smith. Satan. Mm, that became a famous painting. Today we have Duff Smith Hospital in Texas, Duff Smith County, Duff Smith Food, even Duff Smith uh, Peanut Butter. During the Civil War between the North and South, a young reporter was sent to Washington, D.C. to write news about the war, interview famous people. That reporter was called, quote, Howard Galindon, and regularly wrote stories about the war, interviewing famous people in government and military. But what readers didn't know was that Howard Galindon was not a man, was really a woman. And more, that woman was totally deaf. Her real name was Laura 
Rodan, where he became deaf from man in virus at the age of 10. He went to the Missouri School for the Deaf. He got in the habit of writing for communicating with people. Writing always. <coughs> Pad and pencil. He graduated from Missouri School and got a job writing for a newspaper in St. Louis. He also wrote many poems. During the war, the St. Louis Republicans sent it to Washington and she wrote about the war. She interviewed famous people like President Lincoln, General Grant, General Garfield, and many others. In 1862, she wrote a small book called uh, Notable Men in the House of Representatives. And she was writing many poems about the war. Hmm. One of her poems called uh, Bell, Missouri, beautiful Missouri, became the fight song for the soldiers from Missouri. She was a strong supporter of the Northern cause during the war. They called her a literary patriot. Laura Rodden continued to write for newspapers after the war. She wrote for New York papers. She continued to write poetry printed in different magazines. She wrote and printed three different books of poetry. She married a lawyer named Edward Searing and moved to California later on. She was truly the first deaf woman's uh, labor and the first deaf woman to succeed in newspaper journalism and poetry. Hubbard was born in Boston. When she was five years old, she became deaf from a scarlet a fever. Because there were no schools for the deaf in Boston, her parents decided to educate her at home through private tutoring. She progressed with her four hearing sisters and made remarkable progress. She was a natural lip reader and she developed reading skills. When she was nine, they decided to test her by having her take an examination. It was given by a teacher from the Boston Public Schools. They found that Mabel, her work compared equally well with hearing children of the same age. When she was 16, she met Alexander Graham Bell, who was a speech teacher in Boston University. He continued to teach for lip reading. And more than that, she, they fell in love Alexander Graham Bell was working on trying to invent the telephone. He succeeded one year later. He got the patent for the telephone through Mabel's father, Gardner Herbert, who was a famous patent lawyer. They married one year later. Mabel kept up with the busy schedule of her husband. She had two children, but she continued to be creative. She wrote an article on uh, the art of lip reading published in the Volta Review. She helped establish the New York League for the Heart of Hearing. She helped 
a tablet a reading club of Nova Scovia, the first reading club in Canada. She was a remarkable woman. Then, a California sculptor has truly been called, quote, the Michael Enzo of the West. He became deaf from scarlet fever when he was five years old. He went to the California School for the Deaf and showed talent in working with clay and sculpting. He graduated from California School and the Board of Directors sent him to Paris, France to study sculpture. While there, he sculpted one big sculpture called the Bear Hunt, sent to Chicago's World Fair in 1893, where he won a prize. Children came back to America, settled in San Francisco, California, began working in sculpting. Three of his marvelous sculptures are in Golden Gate Bridge Park, the Baseball Pier, the California Volunteers, and uh, Father Junipero Serra, the priest. One of his famous sculptors called, quote, the Mechanic, shows a group of men working at an iron foundry. They seem very real. Mm. In 1906, when the San Francisco was destroyed by earthquake, many buildings crumbled, but there stood the Mechanic, the sculptor still. Mm. Another of his sculptures called uh, The Football Player is on the campus of California University. I have a picture of children's favorite sculpture called The Bear Hunt. That sculpture is now on the campus of the California School for the Deaf. person to succeed in baseball in the major leagues was William Hoy. Hoy became deaf while he was still a small boy. He went to the Ohio School for the Deaf, but he left to become a baseball player. He started with the Northwest League and in 1887 he became to, to the major leagues. He was 24 years old when he made the major leagues and played with five different teams. Hoy was mm, five feet five inches. He weighed only 150 pounds, but he was a mm, giant of an outfielder. He was also fast on the bases. So many bases. Good outfielder with the accurate arm. He played in 1,784 games, collected 2,057 hits. He had a lifetime average of 0.288. He stole bases often. He led the league and his total was 6 or 5 a steal. But Hoy was most known for his 
strong one arm. He led the American League with 45 from the outfield. <coughs> and in one game playing with Washington, in one game he caught the ball and threw it to home. Three times he threw out the runner at home plate. The catcher was Connie Mack, who later became famous as a manager of Philadelphia. That is a record that will never be equal. But Hoy will be most remembered for suggesting to umpire that he say strike any time it's a strike because Hoy couldn't hear the umpire say strike. Suggested one day, why not raise the arm? Well, the umpire thought it was a good idea. Ever since to today, when the umpire says strike, they ah! Another tough person who succeeded in the major leagues as a baseball player was Luther Taylor. Taylor was born deaf. He went to Kansas School for the Deaf, played baseball, graduated from that school, went to the Southern League when he began his baseball career advanced to the Eastern uh, League in 1899, played with Albany, New York. In 1901, he was chosen by Von McGraw, manager of New York Giants. That's where Taylor began his career. He was an outstanding pitcher, strong arm. <coughs> he helped New York Giants won Pennants in 1904 and 1905. In 1904, Tommy Taylor pitched and won 21 games. Altogether, he pitched in 272 games. He won 118 games, lost 105 for a percentage of 0.525. He struck out 766 batters, gave 539 walks. Dummy, people called him Dummy, was very popular with the fans. He had taught his Giants teammates sign language, and he loved to Tease umpire. The story goes that often while pitchman mm, umpire would call ball Taylor. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> ball, ball guy. Uh. And so on. He often got away with murder. Mm. But one day, Tommy Taylor met his. Uh, Water low. He was pitching. Umpire said, "Ball." Tommy said, "You S.O.B." The umpire took off his mask, walked up to a tailor, and he spelled, "That will cost you twenty-five dollars." Tommy, oh, I was dumbfounded. You know sign language? Yes. The umpire said, and what's more, you're out of the game. <laughs> Seems that the umpire had learned sign language from deaf relative. <laughs> Roy Colombo became deaf at the age of seven from meningitis. 
He went to Texas. Texas School for the Deaf became expert swim, practicing every day. When he was 18, he was invited to join the surf club of Galveston Beach in Texas. He met Herbert Brennan, who was a national AIU champion swimmer for a long distance, and he beat Brennan in one mile swim. One year later, he met Brennan again for 10 miles and beat Brennan. His time was 6 hours and 55 minutes. Colombo became a champion swimmer who won all races in the Gulf of Mexico between the years 1929 to 1939. One time he swam mm, 30 miles in 16 hours and 24 minutes. Another time in St. Louis, swimming in the Mississippi River, a 10 mile swim, he competed against Bonnie Wise Muller for 10 miles. And mm, I, mm, mm, after eight miles, Colombo dislocated his shoulder, but he swam uh, with one arm and finished the race. He didn't win, but he finished. Cousin Wise Muller, who became famous in the movies, never finished, he gave up. During all that time, Leroy Colombo was busy saving people's lives, pulling them out of the water if they were drowning. Over 40 years as a life a God, he saved a total of 907 people's lives. 907. It became the world's greatest life a God, and that's printed in the book, Guinness Book of World Records. One of the best architects, architects in the South was a deaf man named Thomas Marr. Marr became deaf when he was a small boy. He went to the Tennessee School for the Deaf, graduated, then went to Gallaudet College in Washington, D.C., graduated with high honors. He wanted to study more architecture, so he went to Boston and studied in Massachusetts Institute of Technology. After two years of study, he went back home to Nashville, Tennessee, became a draftsman in an architect's office. He saved his money, studied more, and after five years, he established his own business in architecture. He became well known for his skill. He designed many fine buildings, apartment houses. He designed the post office in Nashville. He designed the three best hotels in Nashville, and mostly the Tennessee School for the Deaf was his prize designer. He became known as uh, the Dean of Nashville Architects. His work was studied all over the South. 